Uh, hi, I'm Jeremy Hare, the uh, co-chair of the Distinguished Speaker Series Advisory Group at the CFA Society of Chicago. And today I'm here to introduce our guest speaker, Joel Greenblatt. Joel serves as Managing Principal and Co-Chief Investment Officer of Gotham Asset Management. Since 1996, he has been a professor on the adjunct faculty of Columbia Business School, where he teaches value and special situation investing. He's also a director at Pazina Investment Management, which is a global investment management firm. <clears throat> Joel's the author of several books, including You Can Be a Stock Market Genius, The Little Book That Beats the Market, The Little Book That Still Beats the Market, and The Big Secret for the Small Investor. Joel is the former chairman of the board of Alliant Tech Systems, an NYSE listed aerospace and defense contractor. He received his bachelor's and his MBA from the Wharton School at the University of Pennsylvania. Please help me welcome Joel Greenblatt. Thanks very much. Can you guys hear me? Good. So, I really sent this title in uh, to my head of sales as a joke. But, and he took me seriously because he knows I'm a Jet fan, I'm a Mets fan, I am a Knicks fan. And even Warren Buffett says that most people should just index and I'm a value investor. So, I guess the question could read, should I kill myself? <laughs> uh, and I, I, I really, at least in the next few years, don't have a lot of hope for my sports teams, but uh, whether value investing is dead or not is another question. And the answer that you expect me to say is no, and I'm going to say that. I'm also going to say uh, it might be. Uh, I'm also going to say I don't know. And I'm finally going to say I don't care. So I think I cover everything there. Before I get there, uh, let's talk about the S&P 500. So the market fell yesterday. And we value businesses. And I'll explain briefly how we go about valuing businesses. But we value all the stocks in the S&P 500. And we've done that every day uh, since we have good data going back to 1990, weighting it according to the S&P 500. And what that lets us do is it contextualize where do we stand today on a valuation basis versus the last 28 years. And the answer to that question according to the way we value companies, and, uh, and I'll go through that briefly, is we're in the 25th percentile after yesterday towards expensive, meaning the market's been cheaper 75% of the time over the last 28 years and it's been cheaper 25% of the time. The Russell 2000, uh, a little different story. That's in the seventh percentile. It's been cheaper 93% of the time over the last 28 years. And when it's been here in the past, year forward returns have averaged about flat. For the S&P, which is in the 25th percentile, average returns from, it's not a prediction. It's just saying, what's happened from this valuation level in the past? Year forward returns have averaged 5 to 7%. And two-year forward returns uh, 12 to 14. So that's where we are. So subnormal for the S&P, subnormal returns, but not negative. The market averaged 9 to 10 percent returns during that period. So still uh, positive returns. And we don't have to get back to those 9 or 10 percent expected returns. But a few ways we could get back to that is if the market would have fall uh, 17 or 18 percent tomorrow then going forward, our expected returns would get closer to 9 or 10 percent. Uh, but that doesn't have to happen. The market could just under-earn subnormal returns, 4 to 5 percent, in each of the next three years. And three years from now, if we had a normal trajectory of earnings, we would also get pretty close back to that 9 or 10 percent expected return. So I don't know if you call that valueless, but it gives you context. You know, well, it's valueless as to what's going to happen tomorrow or next month, but I think to give you context of where markets are right now, uh, it, it is helpful to us. Uh, 
as far as value is concerned, uh, according to Russell data, uh, value investing did quite well for a long period of time, 1980 to 2006, it outperformed the market by about 2% a year. Since then, last 12 years, growth has outperformed the market by about 5% a year. Hence the question sort of, you know, or at least the worry that value investing is dead. And if you looked at the first nine months of this year, uh, Russell has an index called uh, Pure Value, which really takes the 400 stocks in the Russell 1000 that are closest to value. That was up 1.7% for the first nine months. Uh, the Russell Pure Growth, that was up 286 So underperforming once again, continuing. And why some value investors, at least, it, uh, it's corrected a little bit since then, but still, that dichotomy has been going a long time, and they just put a little another nudge into the value uh, investing uh, world uh, during the first nine months. Why? So it looks like value investing might be dead. On the other hand, uh, what is value investing? Russell defines it amongst other things, and Morningstar would define it as low price book, low price sales investing. Uh, to us, and, and, and the answer is, if you're talking about will low price book, low price sales investing come back, the answer is I don't know. Okay? Uh, I usually use the, uh, uh, the concept of momentum. These are things that have worked in the past. Another thing that's worked well in the past is something like momentum. And it's very clear, a lot of research studies, that momentum's worked very well for the last 30, 40 years, and not just in this country, but across the globe, with one or two exceptions, momentum's worked really well. My problem with it is that if it did not work for the next two years, it could be that momentum is just cyclically out of favor, and all we have to do is be patient, and it works over the long term, it's cyclical, and it didn't work for the next two years, but that's fine, stick to it, it works over the long term. Plenty plenty of evidence that that has been so. But the other choice, if it doesn't work for the next two years, is that there is more data, ability to crunch numbers, computers, smart people, not so hard to figure out a stock used to be down here and now it's up here. It's got good momentum. And the trade over the next two years has become crowded and, and the returns have been degraded and that's why it didn't work over the next two years. And two years from now, I won't know the answer to that question, whether it's just cyclical momentum works over the long term, it's cyclically out of favor, or the trade is crowded and degraded. I feel the same way about low price book, low price sales investing. Why does a company trade close to the historic cost of its assets? Well, people aren't giving much of a premium for the actual underlying business, that's clear. It's likely if you bought a bucket of companies selling closer to their book value, you will get a, a more than your fair share of companies that are out of favor. You know, people don't like or aren't valuing the business very highly. And I believe that's why it's tended to work over long periods of time before the most recent past. But once again, like momentum, it is a correlation with something that's worked well in the past. I think it worked well because low price book, low price sales investing has correlated with getting more than your fair share of out of favorite companies. And if you ask me whether it's gonna to continue to work, I say maybe, I'd say possibly likely, but I'd mostly say I don't care. Once again, momentum, low price book, low price sales, all these kind of factors that have become popular with people at different investment styles, uh, are correlations with what's worked well in the past. It might indicate that you're getting more than your fair share of a type of company. My first day of class, I've taught at Columbia for the last 23 years, and my first day of class, I promised to my students that if they do good valuation work, the market will agree with them. I just never tell them when. Could be a couple weeks, could be two or three years, but if they do good valuation work, the market will agree, the market will agree with them. Stocks are not, stocks are ownership shares of businesses that we value and try to buy at a discount. They are not pieces of paper that bounce around that we put sharp ratios and sortinos on. Big difference. So it is possible that if we're good at doing valuations 
on businesses, the market will not reward us over the next couple of years, but that doesn't mean we're gonna stop doing what we're doing. That's what stocks are, ownership shares of businesses. And so that is actually causation. We're like private equity investors when we think about stocks. We're buying the whole business, like most investors would. And so I don't know about value investing as defined by Morningstar or Russell may go in and out of favor or may stop working, I don't know. But valuation investing, that's what stocks are, ownership shares of businesses. So as Warren Buffett would say, value and growth are tied at the hip. Growth is a portion of how you value something. So I think that whole discussion, uh, as bad as the statistics are, they're not very meaningful to me when I think about being a value investor. So let me turn this thing on. So let me talk about how we go about valuing businesses. And the analogy I usually use that works with most people is, let's say you're buying a house, and they're asking a million dollars for the house, and your job is to figure out whether it's a good deal or not. Pretty straightforward. There are certain simple questions that you would ask to determine whether that's a good deal or not. One question you might ask is, you know, if I rented out this house, net of my expenses, you know, how much would I get for it? And if I could get 70 or 80, 90 thousand dollars a year net of my expenses for that million dollar house in a 3% interest rate environment, that seven or eight or nine percent free cash flow yield on the house might indicate that it might be, you know, priced well. Uh, what's another question I might ask if I were trying to figure out if that's a good deal or not? Pretty simple question. I pretty much know what you'd ask next. What are the other houses on the block going for, the block next door and the town next door? How relatively cheap is this relative to other similar houses? And that's what we do, by the way. We say, how cheap is this company relative to other similar companies, let's say in the same industry? How cheap is this company versus all my choices of company? How, how cheap is this being priced now on a cash flow basis relative to all my current choices? We also have another measure of relative value uh, that we look at, and we go back in history and we see how the market has traditionally valued this business versus other businesses and how it's valuing it today. Just another measure of relative value. Simple way to think about that is if a company has traditionally been premium priced, and today it's available at an average price relative to the market, uh, it's cheaper than it's traditionally been on this particular measure of relative value. It would get a good grade if a company has traditionally been bargain priced relative to the market. Today it's available at an average price, more expensive than it's traditionally been on this particular measure of relative value. It would get a bad grade from us. We would never use any measure of relative value all by itself, right? You can end up owning the cheapest internet stock at the top of a bubble. But we use our measures of absolutely cheap on a free cash flow basis. How much rent could I get for it? Relatively cheap to similar companies, relatively cheap to all companies, relatively cheap to, cheap to history, as checks and balances against each other. And I have a chart that either I turned it off or on. There it is. I only have one slide. That was not very swift. Anyway. So this is a study we did following the criteria I just laid out, valuing businesses just like you'd value a house, right? How absolutely cheap is it? How relatively cheap is it in different ways? This is a study of the, from 1992 to 2012, 20-year study. We just updated it for the last five years. Looks the same. This is a 20-year study of the 2,000 largest companies in the U.S., where we value them from 1 to 2,000 along the lines that I just told you with those measures of absolute and relative value. The x-axis is the valuation percentile. All this means is if you were in the bottom left-hand corner over there, in the first percentile, you would be the 20 companies that measure cheapest according to those measures of absolute and relative value that I just discussed. Out of the 2,000 largest, you're the 20 cheapest. You're in the first percentile. Now, the values of businesses don't change daily, but prices do. So we re-rank daily, and that 1% is continually updated. If you fell in the 99th percentile, that would mean that you were the 20 companies at any particular time that measured most expensive out of the 2,000 largest in the United States. Pretty straightforward. More important is the y-axis. 
The y-axis is the year forward return on average for stocks in each percentile. So what this chart literally says is if you fell in the first percentile, those stocks in the first percentile averaged a one-year forward return of 38% over the next year. Remember, the stocks are constantly updated. Stocks that fell in our second percentile, owning the second percentile stocks, average a one-year forward return of 37%. Then we drop down to the best fit line, which I always say I don't mind missing when we're making extra money. And as we measure something more expensive and the percentile drops, the year forward return drops, and it's pretty linear. And if we had missed so badly in percentile one and two, and I move those down to the best fit line, that fits about 0.9%. So if you were sitting in my class at Columbia, and I said, does anyone see a long short strategy that you might pursue if you could predict ahead of time which stocks would do best, second best, third best in order? And you did not say, I guess I'd buy a bunch of stocks up here and short a bunch of stocks down here. If you didn't say that, I would have to throw you out of class because it's pretty straightforward. That's what you should do, and by the way, that's what we do. So this is a bunch of uh, professional analysts, and if you're a professional analyst, you would look at that chart and say, something's very, very wrong. That's way too good, 0.9%. Uh, and by the way, all the metrics I gave you about absolutely cheap, relatively cheap, everything else, backward looking, no predictions involved. Got a 90% fit. So why, if it's so simple, and I just laid it out for you, uh, is it so hard to do? Well, the answer is that this is an average over 20 years. If what we did, and if we did it this way, and it looked like this every day and every month and every year, and it worked in order like this, everyone would do this. Uh, it doesn't look like this. When you're living through it, it's quite noisy. If I gave you a two or three year snippet within those 20 years, the fit would be nice. It would kind of rhyme a little bit with this, but it would be like 0 0.55, 0 0.6. It wouldn't be 0.9, right? It doesn't work every day and every month and every year. Uh, but what this chart would tell me is, as opposed to momentum or low price book investing or who knows you know, whether it will continue to work, you know, the way you would value a house, the way you would value any earning asset, we can't value Bitcoin, okay, uh, or gold, for that matter. But if we have an earning asset, or an asset that we expect to have earnings, uh, we can uh, perhaps uh, value it, and those very simple measures uh, are approximately how the market values those companies over time, especially if you buy a bucket of them. <laughs> uh, you'll be right on average. And if it's not working in the short term, should we stick to our guns? This chart would say yes. Okay, we have to balance our risks. We have to do a lot of things. Uh, but we should stick to our guns. Valuation is like gravity, is, is the best way I would put it. So, you know, I have a friend who's an orthopedic surgeon, and I, he's head of this group of orthopedic surgeons, and they have a big dinner every year, and you know, for whatever reasons, he asked me to give a talk about investing uh, for about a half an hour to the learned doctors in the room and take some questions, so I gave, explained how the stock market worked for about a half an hour, and then I said, you know, any questions? First question was, the uh, market was down 2% yesterday, should I get out? <laughs> the second question was, uh, oil was up 1% yesterday, should I get in? My conclusion from those questions uh, was that I had just crashed and burned, and they didn't understand anything I had just said about <laughs> the stock market. And I don't know about luckily, but a few days later, I got asked to teach a ninth grade class, all the kids were from Harlem, uh, an investing class, once a week for an hour, teach them about investing. And you know, these doctors had a lot of degrees and they had to be really smart to get there. They were all surgeons and you know, pretty successful guys and women. But now I was asked to teach ninth graders who had no money or interest or background and no degrees yet. And I had failed with the doctors. 
So I said yes anyway. And I thought I had a few weeks to prepare for the first class and I didn't want to fail with the kids. So I thought about it and I walked in the first day of class with a big jar of jelly beans in one of those old time glass jars. And I passed the jar of jelly beans around the room and I passed out three by five cards. And I told the kids to count the rows, do whatever they had to do, write down how many jelly beans do you think are in the jar. And so they passed the jelly beans around, they did their counting or whatever they were gonna do, they wrote down, I collected the three by five cards. Then I went one by one around the room and I said, tell me how many jelly beans do you think are in the jar? And you can keep your original guess, you can change your guess, that's completely up to you. And I went one by one around the room and said how many jelly beans are in the jar? And I wrote down those answers. So here are the results of that test. When I averaged the guesses from the three by five cards, the average guess was 1,771 jelly beans and there were 1,776 jelly beans in the jar. So that was pretty good. When I went around the room one by one and asked them, that guess averaged to 850 jelly beans. And I told the kids that the stock market was actually the second guess. Okay, because everyone knows what they just heard, what they just watched, what they just read, who they just talked to. They're influenced by everything around them. And they didn't make a very good guess. When they were cold and calculating and independent, okay, their guess turned out to be much better. So I think of ourselves as cold-hearted jelly bean counters when we're trying to value businesses and trying to you know, cover our ears and close our eyes and uh, try to uh, figure out valuation without being influenced by things around us. One of the ways to do that is to use trailing numbers <laughs> rather than our own projections. Turns out to work better. Uh, and that's, you know, very much how the stock market works and how, how you can go about beating the market. But then again, I opened them and I said, you know, even Warren Buffett you know, I gave a, a speech at Google a little less than two years ago, and I started it this way. I said, even Warren Buffett said that most people should just index. And then I said, I agree with him. And then I left. <laughs> but then I said, you know, Warren Buffett doesn't index and neither do I, how come? Okay? And the same type of question I get every year when I'm in class, at least for the last six or seven years, someone raises their hand at Columbia and says, you know, hey, congratulations, Professor Greenblatt, on a nice 37-year career, whatever it's been. Uh, great job, but, you know, now there are more hedge fund managers, there's more hedge fund managers, there's more computers, there's more analysts, there's more ability to crunch numbers, there's uh, plenty of evidence to show that active managers don't really add value over time, you know, more or less, the nature of the question is, isn't the party over for us? You know, it's just so much harder now than when you uh, started out. So my students are second year MBAs, roughly 27 years old on average. And so what I say to them is, okay, I'll tell you what, why don't we go back, you know, 20 years when you guys learned how to read, okay? Let's take a look at the most followed market in the world. That would be the United States. Let's look at the most followed stocks within the most followed market in the world. That would be the S&P 500 stocks. And let's take a look at what's happened since you guys learned how to read 20 years ago. And I tell them, from 1997 to 2000, the S&P 500 doubled. From 2000 to 2002, it halved. From 2002 to 2007, it doubled. From 2007 to 2009, it halved. And from 2009 to today, it's more than tripled which is my way of telling them that people are still crazy. And also, way understating the case, because the S&P 500 is an average of 500 stocks. If you lift up the covers and look at the dispersion going on amongst those 500 stocks, between which are in favor at any particular time and which are out of favor, and how often that changes, that doubling, having, doubling, having, doubling, having of an average of 500 stocks is really smoothing the ride. Under the covers, it's, it's really pretty crazy. So if you believe what Ben Graham said, that this horizontal line is fair value, and this wavy line around that horizontal line are stock prices, 
And you have a uh, disciplined jelly bean counting way of valuing businesses you know, and buying them when uh, they're far enough below that horizontal line. And if you're so inclined to sell or sell short stocks when they're above the line, the market's throwing us pitches all the time. Okay? The reason active managers don't outperform, we know a lot of them. They're behavioral, they're agency problems. I sat on a lot of big investment boards. And while everyone is patient, you know, they're run by people. Those people have three-year benchmarks. And, you know, if someone's in charge of U.S. equities or they're in charge of real estate or they're in charge of private equity or whatever, they have a three-year benchmark. And I'm not saying the good places throw you out of there when you didn't beat the benchmark. I'm just saying they don't throw you a parade when you didn't beat the benchmark. And there's an agency problem, and it's not going away. Good news for value investors. So when people ask me about, you know, the future of value investing, and that's our definition of value investing, you know, active management uh, in an intelligent way, I tell them that most people, uh, you know, are very, uh, don't know how to value businesses. So if you don't know how to do that, you shouldn't do it. And then I tell them about a book I wrote called The Big Secret. And I always say it's still a big secret because no one bought it. <laughs> and I tell them a couple studies in that book. One study looked at the best performing, it was done by Morningstar, looked at the best performing mutual fund. I wrote it in 2011. So it looked at the decade 2000 to 2010. The best performing mutual fund, 100% long US equities for that decade was up 18% per year. The market was flat during the decade. So beating by 18% a year was pretty good. The average investor in that fund though managed to lose 11% a year on a dollar weighted basis and you all know how they did it, right? After the market went up, after the market went up, they piled into the fund. After the market went down, they piled out of the fund. After the fund outperformed, they piled in. After the fund underperformed, they piled out. And they turned that 18% annual gain into an 11% dollar weighted loss. Institutions are no better. I showed a study of the top quartile institutional managers for that same decade, 2000 to 2010. So the ones who ended up with the best 10-year record, here are the stats on those guys. 47% of those who ended up with the best 10-year record spent at least three of those 10 years in the bottom decile of performance. So three plus years in the bottom decile. So you know no one stayed with them. 79% spent at least three plus years in the bottom quartile. And everyone, 97%, spent at least three years in the bottom half. So to beat the market, you have to do something different than the market. Your returns are going to zig and zag differently. So even if you were smart enough, OK, you don't know how to value businesses, fine. Maybe you're good at picking managers. But even if you were smart enough to pick that manager who's going to end up having the best 10-year record, almost no one stays with him. So when I think about the future of active management, uh, I would say, you know, versus passive, you know, the active versus passive, I would say that as a business, uh, not very optimistic. I, there'll continue to be a move to passive. There'll be, continue to be, I'm not saying that active won't outperform for the next few years, but then it won't a few years later. So uh, most people won't capture that, and they're starting to catch on to that. So I think there'll continue to be a move to passive. Uh, I think there'll still be a fee crunch for active. Uh, but as a stock picker, I'm super excited. You know, the more people who quit and stop trying to do this, the market is throwing us pitches all the time. We have these opportunities. Uh, so the good news, I'm very optimistic as a stock picker. The business of active management, you know, might, might be so what? I don't know. But uh, it will continue to be challenged as it should, you know. Uh, and as always, not everyone can uh, outperform the, those who are skilled to either value businesses or to find managers and have the discipline. The big secret, by the way, so you don't have to buy the book, not that you could, I, could, I can't even give it away. So um, the, the big secret uh, is patience, okay? Find a strategy that makes sense to you and have the discipline to stick with it. That's few and far between. Uh, Actually, my uh, partner and I looked at this because we run, uh, my partner Rob Goldstein joined me in 1989, and I uh, took a look at this. We watched, 
the mutual fund flows, we run some mutual funds, and we watch them go in and out exactly at all the wrong times. You know, we can see live the, the world's worst money flows, okay? Uh, just chasing whatever the last returns were. Um, and it's uncanny. It's pretty amazing, and it happens to everyone. And we sat down to try to figure this out, and we actually came up with a strategy a few years back to try to uh, address the, the, the drive to passive. Uh, and part of addressing it was to sort of partially give up. Uh, and so what we did is we set up something we called Gotham Index Plus. And what we did was we said, you know, for better or worse, most people use the S&P 500 as their benchmark for whether they beat the market. So we said, you know what, we're going to start there. And so if someone gives us a dollar in this mutual fund, we just recreate the S&P 500 bottoms up, all the stocks in the S&P 500. We don't think we're charging for that part. It's pretty easy to do. But then we buy 90 cents more of our favorite S&P stocks on top of that, and we short 90 cents of our least favorite. We balance those risks. Uh, we, don't let small, we don't want to drive tracking error because, uh, number one, actually, people don't mind tracking error if they always win. <laughs> okay? So we did try to preserve some of that. Uh, but by the same token, we want to underperform uh, uh, during periods. So what we did was we obviously made the 90-90 zero beta. We didn't let small stocks really drive the return. And we actually matched our portfolio a little better. So we weren't as extreme in the 90 cents we like. We bought the cheapest, short the most expensive, subject to you know, why, why are people buying these things? These stocks down here, these stocks are either losing money or trading at 50 or 100 times cash flows. Why are people buying them? Because they think 2023, 2024 is going to be all. Okay? And you know what's going to be down here? Tesla or something like that. People say, oh, you don't get it. You know, the world's changed. Whatever. And I would call something like Tesla the tyranny of the anecdote. There will be some winners in this group down here you know, that are losing money and people are paying or, you know, trading it 100 times. And people will uh, know the name of that winner. In other words, it, I call it the tyranny of the anecdote because some winners will know their names because they won. But it's the world's worst investment strategy to try to find your winners from down here. Uh, there was a famous uh, Damon Runyon line uh, you know, Guys and Dolls was based on, you know, his writings, and he said the, the race is not always to the swift, nor the battle to the strong, but that's the way to bet. And so, you really don't want to be betting on trying to find the winners in here. Uh, and then, why are people being so nice to us? Why are they giving us 7, 8, 9% free capital yields in a 3% interest rate environment? It's pretty clear. That's last year's number. People don't think the next year or two will be quite as good. These are systematically avoided stocks because when you're an active manager, you're trying to make money in the next few years. Whether you're patient or not, your clients aren't. And besides, you're picking stocks. You want to make money. Your happy hunting grounds is not usually in those companies that people don't, it doesn't mean they'll do badly, but just not quite as well. So they're systematically avoided. Meanwhile, they're gushing cash, huge returns on capital. And so that's what we like. Uh, but that you would imagine an unbalanced portfolio. So in that 90-90 in Index Plus, what we do is we balance fundamentals. So you'll see why do they like these down here. Even though uh, Tesla may not be earning money yet, their sales are growing really fast. Other fundamentals are going well. So we try to match fundamentals. So you'll see that our, our longs that we like have just as good sales growth as our shorts. And that's how we're trying to address it. It's almost an impossible challenge. You know, so, so far, so good. And we're having fun trying to design something. And I wrote an essay about this index plus thing, and I said, the strategy that's best for you is not only one that makes sense, but one you can stick with. So if you have, you know, one of the problems with value investing and deep value investing is it works over very long periods of time if you're good at valuing businesses. It's just very noisy. You don't have a lot of people staying with you and a lot of people capturing those returns. So that's why it'll keep going. That's the great news for active managers, but it's also the challenge. Uh, anyway, I'm going to stop there, and maybe, uh, hopefully, you'll have some fun questions and challenge me on some of the things I just said. So thank you. Is there a mic going around?
Hello. How would you regard the dispersion in today's environment between, say, the on the x-axis, between opportunities on the left and the right? How, how would you characterize it in today's environment versus previous environments? Um, dispersion is uh, always there. Uh, it's not materially different. When I updated over the last five years, it looks a lot like this. Uh, the longer you uh, bring out your horizon, obviously the less dispersion you'll have, the shorter periods of time can get very uh, dispersed. And the idea is to balance your risks on the long and short side so you don't have too much imbal imbalances, easy things to do are not be long 0.5 beta stocks and short 3 beta stocks. You know, that's the way to go broke. In fact, uh, in the little book, I, I didn't put a chart like this, but it was similar, you know, where the cheapest did better than the second, better than the third. And so everyone said, hey, why don't you just buy these and short these? And I did that for everyone, and I cheated a little. I didn't rebalance over the course of the year. And if you just bought the cheapest and, and shorted the most expensive without adjusting, right, in the year 2000, you would have lost all your money. Eventually, it was right. And this is exactly how it came out. You know, all those crazy internet stocks did crash and burn. And the stocks that had been avoided, those you know, great money churning out businesses that had high returns on capital but were growing a little slower and no one wanted them, those ended up you know, having spectacular returns. But uh, while you were waiting, you lost all your money. And zero doesn't compound well. I'm sure you did the math to pass the CFA. And so, uh, so you have to balance your risk. And, and there are always a lot of dispersion in the short term. Uh, thank you for uh, speaking to us. Um, while all value investors think <clears throat> we are cold calculating bean counters, I believe we cannot permanently suppress psychology. So on those lines, how do you handle the emotional aspects of investing, specifically regret? Do you employ checklists for your buy or sell decisions or any other heuristics that you might use? Thanks. Well. That's actually a great question. So, well, I'm not going to go there, but a lot of times uh, they say most good investors have a screw loose, so let's leave that out on the, uh, the side. Uh, well, when I first started out, I was doing very concentrated portfolios, and I did that for quite a long time, several decades. Uh, and there, uh, we had concentrated, by concentrated, I mean six to eight stocks were 80% plus of our portfolio, OK? When you know the business is really well, you know, the best way to think about these are actually businesses. You know, Warren Buffett has a, uh, you know, I'm going to, uh, you know, paraphrase here. But he said, imagine that you had a business uh, that you sold for a million dollars. And now you want to reinvest the money intelligently uh, in you know, the city where you live. And let's say there's hundreds of businesses, and you analyze them, and you find you know, six or eight that uh, you know, are run by good people, have good prospects, uh, you know, nice returns on capital, you know, all good things in a nice future. And you did that research, and you divided that million dollars amongst those six to eight businesses in your city that you, know, you liked all those elements to, most people would kind of call you a prudent person. You know, you're dividing, you did your research. But when it comes to the stock market, you can get daily quotes on those businesses. Uh, academics would tell you you're insane. You know, you're taking way too much risk. It's volatile. And so you really have to think in those terms, you know? I mean, read as much Buffett as you can. But bottom line is, if you want to stay unemotional, actually think what you're doing. Think of businesses, uh, stocks as ownership shares of businesses. It's very, very helpful. If something happens in Greece and you own a chain store in the Midwest, OK, are you going to sell it at half price the next day because something happens in Greece? You're probably not even going to think about it. But in the stock market, you know, you're going to get a, a much lower quote, and bad things will happen. You'll think it's relevant in some way. And, and you know, no one who actually owned the business would do anything about that. So, it's better to think of businesses, I mean stocks as ownership shares of businesses is one way to keep yourself sane. Uh, the way we have very diversified portfolios now, because when you go long, short, and put on leverage, you need diversified portfolios. And so when we used to own, how do I stay sane? 
we used to own six or eight names. And every couple of years, uh, we would wake up, Rob and I, and we'd lose 20 or 30% of our net worth in a day or two. It would happen like clockwork all the time. That was just the way it works. When you own six or eight things, something's uh, not going right for your business, or you were wrong on a pick, and that just has to happen. Even if you're right most of the time, you're gonna be wrong, and, you're gonna, and that's gonna happen every couple of years. Most people can't handle that, but that's just part of the game. It has to happen. It's mathematically impossible almost not to happen that way, uh, that the market, or you'll just be wrong on some uh, when you're that concentrated, and, and you have to sort of know what you own and be very cold and analytical, uh, and it's helpful when you actually think, I just own a small group of businesses. Uh, now, when we have hundreds of stocks on the long side and short hundreds of stocks, we're trying to be the insurance company. We're trying to be right on average. And when we actually have more diversity, uh, this is a flaw in, in a lot of hedge funds, it turns out, you know, rather than buy, let's say, three, 400 of the, the cheapest over here, we usually weight them based on how cheap they are, and short three or 400, why wouldn't we just do the top 50 or 100 and short the bottom 50 or 100? I mean, the alpha generation's pretty linear. So why wouldn't we do that? Uh, well, number one, these stocks all the way down here, these are extremely in favor stocks. They're quite volatile. You know, a lot of money losers in there. Up, up there, these stocks are extremely out of favor, much more volatile. You have less of them, more volatile. When you go long, short, and put on leverage, uh, I would say, and you have less stocks, uh, getting aberrationally bad returns is another euphemism for losses, you know. Uh, when, when you go long, short, and put on leverage, you could get what you didn't expect more often when you just have a few volatile names, and you could have some negative compounding. Turns out negative compounding is bad, as you all know the math. And so when you go long, short, and have more names up here and more names here, uh, you have less extreme names on average. You have more names, you know, so less extreme names, less volatile. More names, less volatile. Another way of saying you get what you expect more often, that's why insurance companies don't insure five guys, no matter how good their underwriting is. Someone, you know, steps off a curb and messes up your numbers, you can tell I don't sell insurance. Um, so you, when you go long, short, put on leverage, you uh, get what you expect more often, you spend less time negative compounding, you actually end up with higher returns. Even though the alpha generation is linear, when you go more diversified, you end up with slightly higher returns and a lot less volatility, so there's no trade-off. So that's not really the math that most investors look at. It's not what typical hedge funds look at. They're actually very under, mo most of them are very under-diversified. Uh, even though this is factual, this is what happened. So these guys did beat these guys, but by adding some of these guys, uh, you can actually make more money by keeping less volatile. And so it's one way to, so now our bad days, to be honest, in our diversified portfolios, we underperform by 20 or 30 basis points. So that's how we stay same. That's our bad day, as opposed to losing 20 or 30% of our net worth. So we trained ourselves over many years uh, to be, a, uh, you know, by being concentrated investors for so long. So it's, it's complicated. I would say that the best idea is to think of stocks as ownership shares of businesses and really believe that. Really don't, you know, when I, I got on a very big investment board, and my uh, first memo I wrote with the chairman of the committee said, oh, this is a great memo, you should hand it out, and then I almost got shot. And my suggestion, uh, and you know, I hadn't been there, I hadn't been, you know, it was a, like a really big board and I hadn't been on one yet, it was about 15 years ago, and uh, my suggestion was stop reporting your returns to everybody else so that you just do what you think smart long term and you don't worry about how you compare to all the other guys on the lead table of who did the best and who did the worst. So no one really liked that idea, um, and it might not be realistic, and, but that's the way you should think about investing. You know, Don't listen to what the guy sitting next to you, how many jelly beans he thought there were. Just be cold and calculating as best you can. Hi, I uh, loved uh, You Can Be a Stock Market Genius, and I was just curious if you could uh, compare and contrast the opportunity set and special situations back in the early 90s when you wrote that and today. Sure. Um, well, I still teach that. I have five kids. I taught the ones who were willing to listen to, to do uh, the same types of things. The opportunities are still there. And in my class every year at Columbia, I say, you know, 
what happens uh, to people who are good at finding off the path investments? Uh, you Can Be a Stock Market Genius was about uh, special situation investing mostly value and special situation investing, looking for things a little bit off the beaten path like spin-offs or companies going through some extraordinary transaction where it got a little more complicated, looking at places off the uh, uh, you know, beaten path. I, I uh, opened the book with uh, talking about my in-laws who uh, used to live in Connecticut and, and they would spend the weekends going to tag sales and country auctions looking for um, you know, bargains, they, they collected uh, sculpture and art and, and, and other antiques. And let's say they saw, found a painting uh, that they liked. Uh, and what I said was, their question wasn't, is this guy going to be the next Picasso? Okay, that's really hard to do. Their question was, is there a painting by the same artist that's similar style that just went up for auction for two or three times what this one they can buy? That's a much easier question to do. So they really were going to get their bargain from looking you know, off the beaten path in a place other people weren't looking. They weren't going to get it from being so good at predicting. Okay, And so that's what I called special uh, situation investing. And, and those opportunities still exist. And I ask my students, what do you think happens to people who get good at doing that? And a lot of the answers is they get so rich they have to, uh, uh, they don't have as many opportunities in that area. So there's a new generation that could always look at these small off the beaten path opportunities. Some of them come in big sizes, uh, but there's always an opportunity for people running several hundred million dollars to invest quite well. And I almost call that investing, a, you know, uh, not making money by taking risks, just doing work, uh, doing more work in a place that other people aren't looking. And so that's, you know, I, when I wrote in the book in 97, I said, you know, when you get to $250 million, give me a call. I actually did get a couple calls. Um, and, and one guy who made the Forbes 400 uh, wrote me a thank you note. So that was nice. Uh, but uh, bottom line is that's still there. I think the opportunity set's even bigger because the world's gotten a little bigger than 250 million. But so there's great opportunity always for that smaller cap. As far as the larger cap stuff, there are more people looking. Uh, but people are very emotional. People have a lot of agency problems when they get pretty big like that. And so. Um, you know, that might have gotten a little harder. I really don't think so. I think we go through these cycles where, when I was just describing the S&P 500, the biggest market in the world, doubling, having, doubling, having. There's a lot of emotion still out there. You just maybe have to be a little more disciplined to take, uh, take advantage of it. Uh, and uh, so I am not concerned that those opportunities won't continue to exist, you know, pretty much forevermore, as long as we all remain human, which I think we will. Right, we don't disclose that, but it doesn't matter too much. So the question was, how do we weight our various valuation uh, metrics that I discussed? And while we don't disclose it, uh, I will disclose it doesn't matter all that much. Uh, these are all things, when you're valuing the house, you're looking at all these things. Uh, and as long as they're all substantial uh, parts of it, uh, you end up doing pretty well. Uh, thank you. Uh, Mr. Greenblatt, uh, for a great session. Uh, quick question on this uh, long short uh, strategy. How do you go about sizing? Uh, for example, equal weighting or value weighting or other better, more intelligent way you go with it. The reason I ask is uh, on hit rate base, you could be like 60% or even 80%, right? How about, but how about on PL basis, you could maybe on the, uh, the wrong side, you'd be so wrong that it cancel out on the sure. right ones. So Thank we don't you. equally weight, but uh, as you might imagine, the uh, more the cheaper something is, the bigger discount to our assessment of value, the more we'll want to own of it, and we scale it based on how cheap it is. Um, hit rate really isn't uh, where we make most of our money. Uh, you know, our hit rate's about two thirds. You know, two thirds of the time, just doing this simple stuff, uh, you end up outperforming the market on two thirds of your picks. Uh, it's just the, the, the nature uh, 
you know, of buying these guys that are out of favor already, uh, low expectations already built in, usually, just like people think of typical value investors. And when the bad news comes in, you didn't pay for good news, so you tend to hold up a little better, okay? It's just when the companies do a little better or a lot better than the low expectations. They don't have to do great, just a little better than the low expectations or a lot better. You end up with a lot of asymmetric returns. You end up with a lot of big winners. And we actually make more money from that asymmetry. I wish I knew which ones were gonna be the asymmetric winners, so we just buy them all. And while we make money from our hit rate and while we make money from that asymmetry in the risk reward, which is sort of what investing is all about, right? You know, just bet a little and, and, and have a lot of upside. Uh, one of the, my favorite lines from uh, my book uh, <laughs> was, uh, you know, if you don't lose money, most of the other alternatives are good. Uh, so you're really trying to minimize that. And uh, so we make more money, actually, more money from H symmetry than we do from hit rate. Just FYI. So thanks for the question. Over the last 28 years, it's on the 25th percentile, yeah. Yes, I did. Um, have you looked at the, like, uh, what is the unit uh, value and uh, growth in the world? Right, so the question was, have I looked at the uh, value universe or the growth universe? And uh, the answer to that is no, because I really don't care. The way that Morningstar <laughs> or Russell classify value and growth is nonsensical to me. So I don't care. It's, you know, I, I think I went through a whole list of things and I ended with I don't care. And I think I'm going to st stick with that. Yeah, who has a mic? You? OK. Yep. Um, so I noticed that this uh, chart here applies to the largest 2,000 US companies. Yeah. Um, do you do this type of research for international companies? And your portfolio, uh, diversified portfolio, what percentage uh, would be international? OK. We don't do global portfolios. We do do international portfolios. We do US and ex-US. We only do long investing uh, ex-US. The reason for that is that shorting is, uh, you really have to balance your, when you're, when you're shorting and taking on leverage, both those things are risky. Uh, you have to balance your risks well. And when you go international, you have different trading costs. You have uh, different shorting rules. Uh, you have different currencies. You have different regulatory issues. So you keep, I could snowball the uh, complications doing long, short, you know, with leverage internationally, and we don't really feel the need to, to uh, take that on. We have a big research team and we go, you know, we don't use like a database or anything. We go through every balance sheet income statement, you know, what's that deferred tax asset or pension liability, you know, all those things. How efficient are they when they earn money? How efficient are they when they spend money? Uh, we're looking at all those things. And, um, and so we do that internationally. Uh, but on the short side, like I said, it adds a lot more complication, uh, a lot of different rules, trading costs, every, everything, currencies. They get very, very complicated, so we just do long only, is the answer to your question. Yeah. Your process sounds fairly quantitative, and using historical data and, and historical relationships, and of course, those are things that computers do very well. Do you, what's the role of human beings in your process, and do you foresee that you'll get to a point where ultimately a more refined computer algorithm can do it better than humans? Right, so that's a great question. So I don't view us as quantitative except for the extent, to the extent that to figure out the value of something, you need numbers, okay? But I said, there are many things that have correlated with good returns that quants used, use, like momentum or a low price book or other factors that they use. We only look at things that are relevant to valuation. We do get very quanty in our risk management. You know, we're very quanty in how we, uh, you know, model our trading costs or uh, manage our risk. What risk do we want to uh, make sure that our uh, attributes to our portfolios have? Uh, we use quanti things in risk management, 
in trading, in tax management. We're doing lots of those things in a quanti way. But we're very fundamental in the way we value businesses. Okay? And uh, just like, think about it as we're private equity investors. If you want to call them quants, then we're quants. But in my mind, we're fundamental investors valuing businesses, looking at the data that makes sense for valuation. If you're caught up on the fact that we're not making projections and the value of a company is the discounted value of its future earnings, uh, what I would say is we looked at making all kinds of projections, using other people's projections, using our own, and we ended up uh, doing uh, better not using them. I would love to use them if we were good at it. Uh, we're not. It's hard to improve on this, though. Uh, if, I, if I want to make you feel better about that, I used to visit companies all the time, okay? And, you know, to be a CFO or a CEO of a public company, even if it's pretty small, you have to be a pretty smart person. And I would meet with these guys, and everyone I walked away from, for the most part, I said, oh, that guy's pretty smart, and that woman is pretty smart. Uh, and that story seemed to make sense. The better assumption, however, would have been that if that management had been good at allocating capital before I walked in the door, the better assumption is that they would continue to be good at allocating capital going forward. And if the management had not been good at allocating capital before I walked in the door, the, no matter what, how good their story was, how smart they sounded, the better assumption would be that they would uh, continue uh, not to be very good at uh, allocating capital. Uh, if you were going to buy a store in town that had a million dollars in sales last year and $150,000 in earnings, uh, if you were trying to guess what was going to happen next year, um, my bet would be somewhere around a million dollars and $150,000 in earnings. Uh, and, it, and when you own hundreds of things, uh, it turns out that that's pretty good. So uh, it's not that I don't believe the value comes from the discounted value of future earnings. Uh, I am just saying that on average, and this is really you need a, a big bunch of companies, pretty good guess what happened last year is pretty pretty good guess. And we don't just look back one year, but yes. Thank you for saying that. Uh, let me just repeat that. <laughs> right. So uh, we tested. We we started three and a half years ago. We're the number one fund out of twelve hundred funds in large blend. You know where the S and P is. I just thought I'd mention that. Um, but uh, we tested it beforehand. Uh, we added, we had about 7.1% tracking error against the S&P with 7.1% uh, outperformance with 7.2% tracking error. So most of our tracking error was due to outperformance, which I said was the good kind of tracking error. We don't mind that. Uh, we haven't done quite that since we started. but. Uh, the way usually works in an environment where the market goes up 15, 20% a year, and it's been doing that since we started this thing, uh, people, these are, we call these hope stocks down here, and, and people like hope stocks. And you know, what's been happening since the market tripled is people take risk, and then they get paid for it, so they take more risk and more risk and more risk. That usually ends pretty badly. Luckily, we're not low price book, low price sales investors on the long side, we're cash flow oriented. And you know, cash flow is a big part of the, that's how a private equity firm would value business. And when um, people get optimistic about the world, they do get optimistic about our cash flows. And so our longs end up doing pretty well, and we have not been hit. Uh, while value, traditional value, has gotten hit, cash flow oriented investors like us have not. Even though our definition of value is figure out what is worth, pay a lot less. And that, that and and that's what investing is. <laughs> 